in the interest of time, we are going to start again. I think most people are back in the room. So for this second session, we are actually going to focus on generative models. And our first speaker will be Michael Albergo uh, from NYU, who is currently finishing maybe his PhD. Not yet. <laughs> okay, give it a, take it away. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? Cool. Okay, thanks Mary Lou. Um, so yes, uh, I'm gonna talk about a topic in generative modeling. It's some work I've been doing with Eric Van Den Eyden, uh, and Nick Boffy, who's here in the audience with us uh, at NYU. Um, and the topic is gonna be what we're calling stochastic interpolants, which we're trying to describe as a unifying framework for uh, flow-based and diffusion-based generative modeling. So just some background on me. Um, I'm not an applied mathematician by training. I'm technically a physicist. I'm interested in problems in you know, comp computational approaches to um, uh, quantum field theory, so some, some things in high energy physics, some things in condensed matter. And in addition to that, I'm, I'm interested in developing machine learning techniques that are sort of inspired by the underlying physics um, and the sort of scientific computing demands that come from that. Um, some people call this ab initio AI. So uh, let's roll with that. Just some diagrams here of uh, you know, some things we might like to compute. This is a strong force vacuum energy density, things about how you measure what's going on inside of the nucleus of an atom, and uh, some sort of uh, generative model on a man manifold related to simulating that. Before I go any further, I just want to say thanks to my collaborators and mentors, uh, in particular, uh, Nick and Eric, for <laughs> instrumental in the work we're going to talk about. So um, props to them. The agenda today is gonna to be um, density estimation and sampling with transport maps. So I wanna give a little bit of some motivation and background on the sort of flow-based picture of transport, how people use it for generative modeling. And then I'm gonna frame the challenge of basically, we don't have uh, the maps that provide this transport a priori, and uh, you know, the challenge is to learn expressive and scalable maps. So one inspiration for that is gonna be score-based diffusion, which we know has um, proven to be very successful of late. Um, and what I hope to do is take this um, transport picture and take the diffusion picture and sort of unify them together in what we're calling stochastic interpolants. So what we'll get from this is an unbiased generative modeling paradigm that allows us to uh, use either deterministic or st stochastic processes for the generative uh, process. And we'll discuss a little bit, you know, what's the trade-off between this deterministic and stochastic uh, process and ways that we could design these stochastic interpolants for different things we might want to do. So just to frame the, pro the uh, problem setup, the goal is to estimate the, an unknown probability density function that I'm calling row one. Uh, we're gonna do this in this setting from sample data. And why is this a compelling problem? Where over the past like 10 years, we've gone from drawing black and white digits of numbers to being able to query a large language model to draw, uh, for example, an image of uh, bears acting as chemists um, in a cartoon fashion in, in a matter of seconds. And what I think is compelling about this trajectory is that you know, the measured transport perspective in, in these various advances has started to emerge over the past uh, five years or so. In particular, it's well-founded well in, the, in the diffusion picture. So um, the transport framework of this is gonna rely on the following notions. We're gonna introduce what I call a base density, rho zero. This is something that's usually like a Gaussian. And we wanna build a reversible map that I'll call T that pushes row zero onto a target density that I'm calling row one. So um, if we do this, we get um, an ability to write down the likelihood row one expressly in terms of the transport uh, T. So it, it relies on this uh, determinant of the Jacobian of the uh, inverse of the transport map given here on the bottom. And this is useful because if you don't know row one, you have samples from it, for example, you could learn this map T in a way that allows you to compute likelihoods under row one. So, of course, if we don't have T a priori, we need some estimator T hat to do this. Um, and if you want to be able to compute this likelihood in any computationally reasonable fashion, we need both this determinant term to be tract tractable, so you'll need to put some sort of constraints on T hat, your approximation for the true map. Um, but you also want it to be maximally unconstrained so that in a learning sense, you can learn some sort of expressive map to model your data. Now, this perspective has about a 20, 25-year history now. I mean, you could go back to the 60s if you wanted to, but 
some early work by Chen and Gopinath on Gaussianization from 2000, uh, Esteban, Tabak, and, and Eric from uh, 2010, and then uh, Tabak and Turner in 2013, describe, uh, you know, learning this map is, okay, it's probably hard to do all at once. What if we break it down into smaller sequential steps? So if I learn a set of TK, and I do this under some sort of maximum entr entropy perspective, then if I learn them sequentially, then this sort of breaks the learning paradigm down into a simpler task. And in the mid-2010s, uh, Laurent Din, and Danilo Rosende, and George Papa Makarios spearheaded with their collaborators a ways to uh, make each of these TK an invertible neural network to sort of add expressivity to this, turn it into an optimization problem that's amenable to neural networks. But you can imagine, instead of taking many little TK, I could take the K equals infinity limit here. Um, you know, each TK is infinitesimally small, and this allows me to rethink this transport T as the solution of a continuous time flow. Um, so this flow uh, will be governed by an ordinary differential equation. Uh, this is sort of the idea by Will Grathwall, Ricky Chen, and company. And if we do this, this determinant we had to compute turns into a trace over what I'm going to call a velocity field V, um, it, the Jacobian of this velocity field V. And making this exchange allows us to rely on some clever uh, trace estimation techniques to evaluate the likelihood in a better way. There's the advances of the uh, neural ordinary differential equations that make a lot of this um, optimizable uh, and, and compatible with neural networks. Uh, and we think this is sort of the right way to be thinking about things into the future. So I want to spend some time explaining a little bit what this continuous uh, time flow looks like. Uh, what we could do is think about the flow map which I'll call xt, okay? Uh, and this is gonna be given by our velocity field bt. Um, you can think about it at the level of the particles in this form here, where I have some initial condition at time t equals zero. Uh, we say that the flow map uh, x t equals zero is equal to initial condition x, and that its time dynamics are given expressly in terms of the velocity field b evaluated at the flow map x t. So pictorially, this means something like starting at x0 of x here and then following these flow lines along this uh, map of the change of the probability density from some row 0 to some row 1. Okay. Um, but of course, we can also think about this then at the level of the distribution as the, um, as the, uh, the picture here suggests. And to do that, we need to think about uh, what I'm calling here a transporter equation or a continuity equation that just basically says that the... Um, uh, time dynamics of the change in uh, rho t, which is now a time-dependent probability density, uh, is given by uh, sort of a, a, a current uh, and the, uh, the, the sort of flux of this current. It's basically telling us that the, uh, the probability density needs to be conserved as it evol evolves over time. So if rho t solves this transport equation, then that tells us that our representation of the transport rho t x at time t equal 1 should arrive directly on the density that we wanted to model, which I'll call row 1 here. Let's see. Oh, I got a notification that the meeting is being recorded. Okay, so if, if rho t solve uh, the continuity equation or transport equation here, then we can rely on Benamou Brenier theory to say that there exists some velocity field bt in this continuity equation um, that does this push forward for us at the level of the, um, the uh, samples themselves. And then the question is, how do we find this sufficient bt um, such that uh, this continuity equ equation is preserved that maps rho 0 to rho 1? So some initial work in this direction was done by Will Grathwell and company, um, and they basically proposed to, because we can take the change of variables formula uh, given here in the top right, which is just the continuous time version of the uh, likelihood that I wrote down on the previous slides, um, we can effectively compute a KL divergence between uh, the target, rho subscript 1, and our model, rho parentheses 1. Um, and if we do this, then we can perform some sort of negative log likelihood evaluation. Uh, you know, if BT is some big neural network, and we can use clever tricks like the adjoint sensitivity method to compute the gradients of BT with respect to this objective function, um, then we can effectively train these models. The trouble is that computing this objective involves integrating the ODE itself. Uh, that means it involves solving these equations given here in the top left uh, every time you want to compute the loss of 
uh, in your training paradigm. So this is going to be expen uh, very expensive. And moreover, um, there are many BT which would tell you to go from row 0 to row 1. And it might be useful to have your learning algorithm choose that path ahead of time. So this sort of asks, you know, is there a simpler, a simpler paradigm for learning BT instead of relying on this maximum likelihood estimator? Well, one inspiration for that could be score-based diffusion. We know that this has been a resoundingly successful generative modeling paradigm. I could um, feed one of these uh, score-based language models the sentence, a brain riding a rocket ship headed toward the moon, and I'll get that image pretty immediately. Um, you know, this is the work of Yang Song, uh, Stefano Armand, that's sort of built on the ideas of uh, Yasha Sol Dickstein and uh, Apo Hivarin, and, and some of the denoising perspectives of these models uh, goes back to Vincent in, uh, in 2011. But the main idea is the following. You have a data density. Perhaps it's images of dogs. Um, and you want to devolve uh, these images under some Gaussian noise until at some time t equals infinity, um, this uh, sample has been totally lost. The signal has been totally lost to noise. And this is actually described by a stochastic differential equation called an ornstein ohlenbeck process, given here in the top. And that seems pretty useful a priori, because it doesn't tell you anything about going backward. But if you look at the SDE that describes the backward evolution from the Gaussian to the data, then what pops up is this uh, term uh, grad log rho t. Okay? And that's what we call the score of the density. And if you want to learn a model, for example, that tells you how to go backward from the Gaussian to the data, then it amounts to learning a model uh, for this score function. Because then this SDE is simulable, um, and you could sample under the data density. Moreover, Song and company show that there's also an ODE formulation of this. I've stripped down this SDE to be sort of in this basic form, but it tells you how you can write down a deterministic mapping from this case, again, relying on the score. So yeah, um, what is really useful about this perspective? Why does it work so well in comparison to some of the other stuff? We know maximum likelihood is a really useful concept. So you know, how can something be beating it? Um, well. One idea that we think is quite important is that what's happening here is that there's data available for every time uh, t uh, under row t, through the whole map from row 0 to row 1. And this is quite useful, because if you can evaluate the path everywhere, then you are effectively choosing a path in the space of measures from row 0 to row 1 that you can, um, allows you to turn this generative modeling into a regression problem. I just need to learn s at every uh, time density row t. Um, and I could do this now in sort, of a, in sort of a quadratic loss form. This is basically saying that if I can fit a model s hat of t to grad log rho t uh, using these score matching techniques of Apo Havarinen, then uh, this simplifies the learning paradigm quite a bit. But there are some limitations to this that, you know, may be empirically useful or maybe not. Go ahead. Ah, so you're asking what uh, grad log rho t is with respect to a denoiser. Yeah, is it, is it more yeah, so if we go back. So in this picture, what, what we have is a noise process here that I'm calling uh, uh, dxt equals minus xtt plus square root 2 times some, uh, some incremental Brownian, uh, uh, Brownian noise. What's happening is as we go this way, we're adding noise to this image until the signal's entirely lost. The reverse process is not the same as the forward process. What comes up is that you need uh, information about the time-dependent density anywhere along this map. If I say this is uh, uh, row 1, and this over here is row 0, um, then I need to know row t everywhere in the in intermediate time. In fact, I need, I need to know the, the gradient of its lock density. Exactly. Yeah, it's the density that um, follows this. If, if you're looking at the deterministic dynamic, follows this continuity equation. In the other case, it would follow fokker planck equation. OK. So they established this simple regression problem. Um, you know, there are a few uh, caveats to this. One is that it requires that you transport to a Gaussian. The OU process relies on this Gaussianity. And so if you want to build a generative model between any other two densities, this is going to be one limitation. The other part is that technically, this OU process only converges to the Gaussian in the t equals infinity limit. So in this noising interval, you actually need to be able to evaluate 
rho t of x, or grad log rho t of x, across the entire interval 0 to infinity. In practice, this means we have to truncate at some high t, um, and you know, in doing so, this introduces a slight bias in the model. I will say it converges exponentially quickly, so t does not really need to be that large for this to work decently well. But it sort of asks the question, you know, once this is thought of as a regression, it's not a priori clear that you need this OU process uh, uh, to make this generative modeling paradigm work. So we can ask, you know, how can we work on a fixed interval, t equals 0, 1? We choose an arbitrary starting density, rho 0, and we go to some uh, other density, rho 1, and we can build some connection between them that directly gets this velocity field um, that's in the picture of the um, continuity equation as I introduced the flow-based transport without having to rely on this OU process, or initially a notion of the score. But we'll see that's kind of still useful. So to do that, I'm going to describe a really simple function that I'm going to call an interpolant function. Okay? This is going to be i of t, x0, x1. It's a function of t, uh, time in the interval 0, 1, samples from the base density, samples from the target. Um, and importantly, this is a, a function with the boundary conditions that at time t equals 0, uh, this interpolant evaluates to x0, and at time t equals 1, it evaluates to x1. Sort of trivial example here is just 1 minus t times x0 plus t times x1. And the takeaway I want you to get from this is that if x0 and x1 are drawn iid randomly from their respective densities, then i of t, this interpolant function, is a stochastic process which samples the intermediate density rho t of x. And we call this sample x sub t. So just in this picture, this means that you know, if I um, take any x0, which is this single uh, normal Gaussian, to this uh, uh, mixture model at time t equals 1, we can get any uh, uh, smooth interpolation between uh, rho 0 and rho 1 at the level of the density by sampling the stochastic process. So you know, more formally, we would say that rho t of x is equal to expectation over samples from the base density samples from the target density evaluated uh, along the interpolant under this uh, Dirac delta function. So my claim is going to be that this does indeed satisfy a continuity equation. Uh, if we look at the form of rho t, uh, just as a reminder, this continuity is, is, is given here. And you can ask why. And it amounts to, you know, intuitively looking at uh, uh, the time derivative of rho t evaluate uh, that we have written up here. So if you expand, uh, if you apply the chain rule on rho t here, you can see that we can rewrite this expectation over rho 0, uh, rho 1 in terms of the, you know, the time dynamics, when we take the derivative of the interpolant, times the gradient of this delta function, which allows us to write a current density expressly um, uh, that I'm calling jt of x here. And moreover, if I rewrite jt of x in a way that pulls out the uh, interpolant density rho t, I can get a form for the velocity field directly. So now we have that bt of x is equal to uh, the current divided by the time-dependent density. You know, if you plug this in above, you'll find that we solved this continuity equation generically, writing this as a current. This is true for the case where uh, rho t of x is greater than 0. So we have support. Otherwise, it's going to be equal to 0. So at this point, it's going to be useful to introduce a, a slightly different uh, definition of a conditional expectation with respect to this interpolant xt. Okay? So uh, the important part here is we're going to say this conditional expectation of any function f, that's a function of t, x0, and x1, uh, given that the interpolant is equal to x, is such that the uh, integration under the time-dependent density rho t is accessible via expectations only with respect to rho 0 and rho 1. So we can get these conditional expectations with only taking expectations over rho 0 and rho 1 when we have this condition on the interpolant. And if we think about things this way, it gives us a very simple form for this velocity field that before I wrote down as the you know, ratio of a current density over the probability density. Um, if you take the form of the current, you take the form of the density, you write them out, you see that this is expressly a conditional expectation of the time dynamics of the interpolant. So, you know, this is, this is nice because we're going to want to evaluate rho, uh, bt over the time-dependent density rho t. And if we can do so by just uh, uh, sampling under our, our endpoints, then this is um, maybe a useful paradigm for setting up some sort of optimization. The proposition that I'll make is that the PDF rho t, 
that we just described satisfying the continuity equation has a velocity field, b, which is the unique minimizer of a simple quadratic objective function. It's basically saying because we can sample under row 0 and row 1 to get uh, expectations under uh, conditional expectations under row t, um, we can just match a model of the velocity field b hat to the time dynamics of the interpolant evaluated under row 0 and row 1. Of course, taken over the full time interval t equals 0 to t equals 1. Here I've used some shorthand notation to say that x of t is ex explicitly written as uh, the interpolant evaluated x0 and x1. Okay, why is this nice? Okay, the loss is directly estimable. This allows us then to take something like the score-based diffusion paradigm, but now have a generative model connecting any two densities. It does not require this OU process. And because we're satisfying this ODE, you know, we have uh, likelihood evaluations available to us and sampling is efficient because we have very fast ODE integrators. You can write down a bound between the model density row one of x and the target uh, row subscript one uh, based on the Wasserstein two distance. I'd say it's maybe a little vacuous because it re requires sort of an exponential with respect to the Lipschitz function of a neural network, which is probably not so controlled, but at least you can do it. And uh, you know, it works in practice. For example, what we can have above is you know, this, uh, uh, we have a map from some complicated density in 2D uh, to this checkerboard density over here at time t equals 0 to time t equals 1. You can see what the interpolant would say the path is. You can see how well the flow learns it. You know, you can benchmark it on the ImageNet data, and importantly, it scales, you know, quite well uh, in high dimensions. So on, you know, a 128 by 128 by 3 dimensional problem, uh, we can get this to work decently on around a single GPU. But okay, so this only gave us a deterministic map. We, you know, this was the part of this um, paradigm that is the, the flow-based transport picture of things. But you know, we know that score-based diffusion works under a stochastic dynamics as well. And it might be interesting to think about if we can do something similar to sort of complete the picture here. So um, indeed we can. Uh, and I'll say that it uh, initially just in perspective amounts to learning what we'll call an interpolant score. So this is a score function that's related to um, the dynamics of the interpolant if we change the interpolant a little bit. So we had this interpolant before I was calling i t of x0, x1. Um, but now if we add some Gaussianity to the interpolant via a factor here that I call gamma t z, where z is distributed as a, um, as a Gaussian variable and uh, um, gamma t is such that it disappears at the endpoints, then we can make the following proposition. Just relying on the same notion of conditional expectation that I wrote down before, okay, the exact velocity field bt of x is now not just um, written in terms of conditional expectation with the time dynamics of the interpolant it, but also with respect to this uh, gamma tz term. Not much has changed. We've just add uh, dt gamma tz to the definition of, of b here. But you can use the same sort of uh, proof techniques to then show that the score of the um, uh, time-dependent density rho t is given as uh, minus 1 over gamma times the conditional expectation with respect to uh, our Gaussian latent variable z. And in fact, this minimizes a very similar quadratic objective to the one that we wrote down before. Instead of b, we now we have an, an objective function for s. And so now we have a way of learning sort of the score function and can uh, potentially then use it in some sort of stochastic generative model. So, sort of to summarize, before we've described a transport equation given here um, and learned a uh, velocity field b, right? Now we can think about a Fokker-Planck type equation that says because we have the score available to us, we can ask um, what sort of equation does this augmented uh, a drift component that I call b forward or backward here, which is given as b plus or minus some epsilon times the score, that allows us to write down a uh, SDE that can be integrated stochastically for, as a generative model. It's dependent on bf and it's dependent on the score. So in the first paradigm, you can learn either just b hat. In the second paradigm, if you want to have some sort of stochastic dynamics, you can learn b and s. But OK, if you can do this, is there any sort of trade-off between the two? Why would one want to use the ODE versus the SDE? Is there an accuracy paradigm? 
you know, that we can think about here. We've introduced an epsilon into this stochastic differential equation. Is there any dependency on that? Why would one want to do this? Well, um, you could start by asking Nick, who's in the audience, uh, who has a, you know, a clever way of showing basically that um, the, the following statement. If I have some model density rho hat, okay, I've removed the time and the x from the labeling here just to keep things simple, and I want to know if I've pushed forward from row zero to row one using a deterministic dynamics from that transport equation we gave before, uh, given by the, uh, the, the velocity here b hat. And I want to know the KL between pushing forward with the approximate uh, model b hat versus pushing forward with the exact model b. Well, you'll see that the, the KL sort of expands between these, uh, these two densities to be a difference of the score terms, grad log rho hat and grad log rho as well as the difference between um, the, uh, the drift terms b hat and b. And you would hope that if you've matched b hat to b, and you've gotten close at least, that this should control the KL. But unfortunately, matching b's is not actually sufficient in this scenario, because the Fisher divergence is uncontrolled by small errors in b hat minus b. OK, but slightly differently, if we think about a approximate model for uh, the forward, uh, forward model of the SDE, which we call here BF, which is B hat plus epsilon S, then sort of miraculously this problem disappears because um, the introduction of the, uh, the, the score term actually cancels some things in the equations for the KL divergence. And now you can actually um, control the KL solely based off the difference of the drifts between BF and S. So this is sort of suggestive. It says maybe that we can do better if we use an SDE for, as a generative model. But you know, does this mean much practically? There's two scenarios which we wanted to test this. The first one is um, in the case of Gaussian mixtures. For the Gaussian mixture case, uh, the exact forms of B, BF, the score, et cetera, the velocity fields, are given, um, are given uh, analytically. So we can do the following. We can say, um, let's look at a 128-dimensional Gaussian mixture. Let's take small slices, OK? Of, of you know cross sections, two dimensions of this, so we could visualize things a little bit here. So this here is a cross section of this high dimensional density over two uh, two dimensions. Um, you can see that uh, what we're looking at here is basically a difference between uh, the the uh, true density based off of the um, analytical solution and the model. And what we'd like is that um, each frame of this to be entirely gray. It means we've learned perfectly. Where you see red means that we've underestimated the, uh, the target Gaussian mixture. Where you see blue means that we've uh, uh, overestimated the target Gaussian mixture. Or sorry, the other way around. But ideally, you know, you'd like to see just gray, which says that these two match exactly. And what we have here is over um, different values of epsilon, epsilon 0 corresponding to the ODE, epsilon 4, epsilon 12, we see that there seems to be a sweet spot, a certain epsilon where you do better uh, than you would using the ODE alone, or with too much noise added into the stochastic dynamics. And in particular, you can um, plot the KL by sort of uh, uh, doing some kernel density estimation, as we've done here, uh, to see that you know there is a sort of minimizer of this curve here for B and S. There are a few ways of learning this, but I figured we'd stick with just B and S. And we see that sort of falls around epsilon equals five. So you know we're pretty close to finding an optimal epsilon. The theory says that the optimal epsilon should be a ratio of the losses for, for B and S. Um, and so, you know, maybe this is what this is telling us is that uh, we've learned S a little bit better than we've learned B. But I will say, um, you know, these results are not necessarily generic. If you try this on an image data set, you'll see basically no difference between the models. There's too many small hacks that go into getting those things to work very well. Um, but in the case of Gaussian mixtures, we have things kind of nicely controlled. So, so the nice thing about this, this framework, let's go here, Oops. is that epsilon is chosen after everything else. So you've learned B, you've learned S, then you're free to choose what epsilon you use in the integration. So you could use the same network for all of them. And then, of course, you're comparing it to the analytical solution. So then you can do this comparison. OK. And then the last thing I want to say is that you know, now that we've written down this framework of thinking about things in terms of interpolants, there's a, you know, opens up the freedom to ask, OK, what other sort of uh, mappings can we, can we write down? 
you know, we have a set of rules. We have some boundary conditions on the interpolant. It needs to end and begin at the right place. Um, and then, of course, uh, if you want the score, then there needs to be some sort of Gaussianity somewhere in the interpolant, either at an endpoint or by including this latent variable gamma tz in the middle. But you can do some different things then besides just mapping to a Gaussian. I thought it might be fun to show a few. For example, you can write down what we call a mirror interpolant, which is just the function x sub t equals data from your target density, x1, plus this Gaussian latent variable. And what this is saying is as t goes on, you add noise to your interpolant, and then you remove it. But you go from the density, row 1, back to the density, row 1. So it's like a map to and from itself. And what this means is that if you have some image, like a, like a flower here with a little bug on it, and you use the, um, your model of, the, of the, uh, the score, for example, here, you can uh, basically edit these images to change them under stochastic dynamics. You're going to, depending on the level of noise, change this flower to be another flower in the image data set um, that is different from the, from the original flower depending on the scale of the noise, um, which is kind of like a weird way of controlling uh, your image generation process. But you know, this may take many SDE steps. It's maybe not the best idea in practice. And then the more conventional one that we're used to thinking about is you know, this one-sided interpolant, as we're calling it, which is saying one of the densities is a Gaussian, and you'd like to go to some image set. So again, uh, we can write down the B. We can write down the S exactly. We can write down our, our loss functions to, to do this then. But just a point to stress is that we have, as, as Hugo was just uh, allowing me to point out, a uh, way to have a tunable amount of diffusion. So this first line here is generating a pair of lilies from Gaussian noise. Um, and if we take the initial starting condition that we had for epsilon equals 0, and we add some noise now for epsilon equals 1, you can see that we drift to a slightly different flower. If you add a little bit more noise, you end up to something that is not even reminiscent of the uh, original structure, other than maybe around the colors. And if you increase the noise even more, you could end up to an entirely different uh, image in your data set. Um, so there's some stuff to think about here about uh, you know, a framework for the initial parts of the generating process. The caveat is the more noise you want to add, the more uh, stochastic steps you need to take in these integrators. So it's not necessarily clear you know, that the benefits of, uh, that we saw in the Gaussian mixture case from using an, from an SDE really apply in the case of uh, you know, costly image generation type problems. OK, so just as a quick summary, you know, we've discussed a method that of calling stochastic interpolants here. Um, that allows one to build deterministic or stochastic generative models between arbitrary densities. And hopefully it provides a language for designing new types of maps like this. Um, some questions going forward, though, is you know, can we use this interpolant paradigm to study the inductive bias in transport-based generative models? Uh, you know, what are these ass uh, assumptions we've made on the OD and the ST framework, and are they realist realistic for discerning any sort of discrepancy between the two? Are there better ways to sample? Are there ways to use this for variational inference type tasks and ways that we can actually try to study things a little more closely? And if you want some more information, you should see Nick, who's here for the week. Um, if you want to learn a little bit more about optimizing the transport in terms of uh, uh, you know, optimal transport or the Schrodinger bridge problem, you could check out the two papers, uh, as well as for uh, more experimental details and some preliminary code is available below. Thanks. Thank you very much, Michael. Do we have questions from the audience? Um, I was wondering if there is any concrete example in which you can show that this is better than saying the usual uh, where I do <coughs> let's say your competitor is I do want to spend a little bit long time mm -hmm. and I estimate the score with whatever you want and then I do reverse. Right. Right. And in principle, your thing should work better when you're very high dimensional. So can you think of an example where you can do this consistently? Where you can well, show the same thing, but let's say for it. Well, I, I, would, I would say um, it's not necessarily the case that this is going to work better. Because in fact, you can think of score-based diffusion as a subset of this. I think actually I have a backup slide with me. I, I thought maybe someone would ask this. If you want to think about score-based diffusion as an interpolant, then you choose um, the uh, time-dependent components on the initial data x0 and, uh, and the Gaussian noise z to just be the following terms. So you take e to the minus t, square root 1 minus e to the, uh, e to the minus 2t, 
and you take time to infinity, this is score-based diffusion right there. Um, so in principle, you know, they should be doing approximately the same stuff. If you actually benchmark them on some image, image data sets, uh, you're gonna see that the, you know, these FID scores that people compute to compare how well they're doing on their generative modeling task are all about the same ballpark. Um, the one thing I would say that actually is kind of a nice feature of score-based diffusion is you only have to learn one term, just the score, um, if, for both the ODE and the SDE. If you wanna use the ODE for what we've described here, then you need to just learn B, but if you wanna use the SDE, then you need to learn B and F. Um, but the one thing I will say is the cases where I think this is more useful is actually in sort of scientific domains, so scientific problems for generative modeling, because you can more exactly compute the likelihood and trust uh, 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 trust those, those numbers because we don't truncate at any point. You know, they take a large T, they have to truncate it at some point. This introduces a bias into those quantities. Yeah. Now, scientific computing, so can you think of a concrete example in which choosing the final thing not to be the ensemble number actually is useful? Ah, mm, a proof. That would actually be your question. Yeah, so a proof is kind of. I think hard in general for that case if you don't want to think about Gaussians. Um, Nick might have some ideas though because he has some toy examples of where this case, this is the case, but I think there's some Gaussianity hidden in there. But in a practical sense, for, for example, say you, uh, one, one common thing in, in uh, you know, scientific computing is sampling under some target density that we want. We only know through access to the log likelihood. Right? But if you want to build a map, you'd hope maybe you could build a map to some proximal a theoretical description that you can evaluate analytically, some perturbation of some Gaussian system that then is close to the target system that you want. Um, this is, would be a paradigm that allows you to build in structured information into that method. Yeah. No problem. So I'm, I'm, can you clarify what you meant by the, the first density? You were saying basically like a Dirac measure or something? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I think you, well, the, the, there's, there's some trouble that emerges in one sort of existing on a lower dimensional manifold, right? So uh, there are people have done a lot of work on trying to write down what these uh, uh, transport maps look, look like when you're not preserve, perfectly preserving the sort of topology of the space. And there's some tricks like augmenting it to you know, R3 that you can do that then make everything work. But in general, if something was in R2 and going to R3, this wouldn't really work out. Um, yeah, no, th there's ways to do that then. But you just can't actually change dimension. And you, yes. So when I think of, in, you're interpolating, there's a lot of freedom, right? When I think of interpolating between a trivial case of just a Gaussian over here and a Gaussian over here, two ways to do that would be to do what you put in your picture, which is scoot the Gaussian over. But another way, which is I think shorter distance in the information space, is to just grow one Gaussian and shrink the other in place. Right. Can you speak to what guides sane choices of the interpolation? Yeah, so actually the two you've talked about there, one it amounts to what's called like a Moser flow, mm -hmm. and you can do it by interpolating at the level of the densities themselves. That's the one where you've appeared and disappeared. Yeah. The problem is that results in a, a pretty ill-conditioned velocity field. So <clears throat> the, the velocity field you'd have to learn to do something like that, I, I mean, we could talk about it if, if you like offline, doesn't look um, nice in any sort of learnable sense. If you wanted to do this one where you're just sort of shifting it over, um, then uh, an interpolant at the, uh, that uses sort of trigonometric terms, so like a cosine of pi t and sine of pi t, would, uh, would give you something that's sort of variance preserving along that path, um, which should work a lot better. <laughs> 
Any other question? Well, if not, let's thank Michael again.